So I've been uh, privately and quietly. I got to confess something to you guys. Um, proclaiming the year of 2022. I love you. I've been proclaiming the year 2022 the year of tears. Um, over the last five months, um, I really feel like God has been giving me the permission to feel. Um, I, I would venture to say, and I think Amy would back me up on this, I think I have, I've wept more in the last five months than I probably have in the last five years. Uh, and I, I feel like I'm starting to see and understand tears as a gift. Uh, Jim Valvano was a, um, he was a uh, American college basketball player, uh, coach, and broadcaster. And uh, he was beloved in the world of sports. Uh, he actually became a legend uh, in the world of sports uh, when he, he basically he was diagnosed with cancer and he courageously fought for his life uh, until his body yielded to it. Uh, but he gave a, this iconic speech at the 1993 ESPYs. And in the speech, he famously said this. He said, you know, there are three things that we should all do every day. There's three things we should do every day. Number one, we should laugh, okay? We should laugh every day. Number two, we should think. We should spend some time in thought. And number three, we should have our emotions move us to tears every day. He said, so if you do that, if you do, if you, if you laugh every day and you think every day and you, and you cry every day, that's a great day. That's a heck of a day. Now, I'm not there yet, okay? I'm not crying every day yet. I mean, the year's young, okay? The year's young. Uh, it could happen. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I will. But what I do know is that, that tears are a gift. They are a gift, Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I'm starting to see, and as I've been processing this the last couple of weeks, I'm, I'm starting to see that tears are not just a gift to me. I believe that tears are a gift to this house. Tears are a gift to this house. And it's not, it's not, not just for me, it's for this house. You know, we call ourselves the rock, amen? Is that who we are? We're the rock? Well, I feel like we have allowed ourselves for too long to be a people who have soft skin and tough hearts. Easily offended, hearts unrepentant. But God is doing a new thing. God's doing a new thing. I believe that uh, there is a new era a new culture, a new wave, a new season, whatever you want to call it, okay? And as I've been processing this, one of the things that has happened, um, I, you know, in September of 2021 is, um, you know, when I was ordained here in, in front of you all, and, you know, Bob had, you know, been transitioning most of that year and so I began taking on a lot of, you know, what he was starting to unload. And so I, I felt like it was just kind of putting a name to something that was already happening. But something happened to me when the men of God and the women of God laid their hands on me and they prayed. And I've spent months trying to wrap my head around what God was doing in that moment. And in all this time, God has been sharing this with me. He's been telling me that we are moving into something new here. And I even feel like I have a, I have a, a finger on the characteristics of this new move. Are you, are you guys okay to hear this? Yeah. All right. I feel like the characteristics of this new move is truth, transparency, repentance, and vulnerability. Come on. That is who we are. That is the new new. That, that, is, that is what we are walking in here. We're walking in that. You know, uh, and so we will not be a people. 
with soft skin and hard hearts here at The Rock. No, no, we will be a people with tough skin and soft hearts. Hard to offend. Listen to me. Hard to offend, but sensitive to what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. Amen? You know, the Bible is full of uh, promises of blessedness for believers. Uh, the Bible says in, in Proverbs sixteen twenty, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. You know, but that Hebrew word blessed, and you guys are going to have to just deal with me today, okay? Um, I usually, when I preach, I usually kind of anchor myself in a text and I preach from that text. I'm just everywhere right now, okay? Um, but this word uh, blessed in scripture, uh, the, the Hebrew word for blessed um, is much more than mere happiness, all right? That the Hebrew word for blessed in scripture means multidimensional flourishing, all right? I've prophesied this over some of my friends in the last couple of weeks, but I believe it's for all of us, that as the people of God, we are to walk in multidimensional flourishing. That's who we are, right? So in other words, you guys are looking at me like you don't even know what I'm talking about, okay? In other words, the salvation that God is bringing into our lives as believers, as the children of God, the salvation he's bringing into our lives is not just sufficient for the forgiveness of sin and admission into heaven. Let's go. Come on. Right? No, no, no. What this means is blessedness, the salvation he's bringing into our lives means that God is healing us slowly but surely in all of the dimensions of life. Yes. Amen. You guys are like half here, half not. Some of you guys are trying to figure me out, like, bro, where are you going? I think some of you, Rob, what's up, buddy? Good to see you, my man. I'm going to have you get up here and rap in a second. So, so let me just kind of explain to you guys how this is working itself out in my life. Is that okay? Uh, quick story. So in 1989, I was six years old. And I lived in San Francisco uh, with my aunt and my uncle and my cousins. And I was dealing with a really excruciating pain in my stomach, suffering from what we would later find out was appendicitis. And, um, and so I was in my cousin's room, laying on my cousin's bed when it happened. Everything began to shake. And, and not just shake but rumble. I looked up from where I was laying on the bed and I saw the TV on our dresser just hopping up and down violently. It was the 1989, 6.9 on a rector scale, $6 billion Loma Prieta earthquake that originated in the Santa Cruz mountains just 60 miles south of where I lived. And so I heard my aunt and my cousins running out of the apartment because it was apparent that it was way too dangerous to stay in there. And so I'm just laying there, unable to move, in fetal position, watching my world fall apart. And I thought to myself in that moment, man, if I can just, if I can just get through this, I'll be okay. And I did. I survived, but something happened to me in that moment. In that moment, I was familiarized with an all too familiar scenario. Um, I did not have my dad in my life. I didn't know who he was. And my mom um, had to give me up. And so I was living with my aunt and uncle. And so I just saw in that moment, no one to the left of me, no one to the right. It was just me. And so in that moment, I just felt my heart harden a little bit. Um, but not for long, because when I was 19 years old, I went to a summer camp. My hot girlfriend invited me to a camp. She's my wife now, so I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> it 
she invited me to a camp, and the camp was in the Santa Cruz Mountains, by the way. And on a softball field, I encountered Jesus. And in that moment, he began to take away the hardness of heart for me. Now, what I would like to say, I, I wish I could tell you that all of that stuff was reconciled in that moment. But what I'm learning is that there's layers to this. Okay, there's layers to the healing that God is bringing into my life, right? And just in the last couple of weeks, this is why you guys are getting this real intense, sappy version of me, so <laughs> forgive me for being in my feelings. Last couple of weeks, God began to peel back another layer as I saw brokenness in one of my kids. So another story, a couple years ago, I was uh, actually, one of my daughters was trying out for a talent show at her school. And when she tried out, it did not go well. And so she came home and she began to tell us, you know, the whole family, she began to tell us how that talent show uh, tryout went. And I'm ashamed to tell you guys that I laughed. I laughed. Not only did I laugh, but we all laughed. Even she laughed as well. And so I thought it was funny to all of us, but I laughed. And not only did I laugh, but every now and then I bring it up. Every now and then, just to crack a joke, I'm talking about it just to kind of, you know, lighten the mood. But it never occurred to me that it actually wasn't that funny to her. And then a couple weeks ago, she was... She was trying out. I'm working on this. She was trying out for the choir at her school. And uh, I'm a hot mess, thanks. Love you. Thank you, Maggie. She was trying out for the choir, and I wasn't supposed to pick her up. It was her mom who was supposed to pick her up. But something happened, and so I went to pick her up. And as I got there, I saw her wiping tears off her face. Her hood was up. And she was walking towards the car. Clearly did not want me to see. And so she gets in and I see it the whole way. And so as soon as she gets in the car, I turned to her and I said, what happened? Who you need me to beat up? Yeah. <laughs> and she says, nothing. Nothing's wrong. I said, there's clearly something wrong. I mean, eyes puffy, right? Like red-faced. I mean, she's half black, and she still has a red face. <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong? And she goes, nothing. I said, why are you crying? Literally tears streaming down her face. Why are you crying? She says, I'm not crying. The whole way home, I cannot get her to tell me what's wrong. She wouldn't confess there was anything wrong. She wouldn't even confess that she was crying. And it was then that I realized, man, she has to harden her heart towards me just to protect it. You know, all the commotion that I make about my own brokenness and 
stuff that I have to deal with because of the way I was raised, what I realized in that moment is that my daughter also has brokenness. And not only does she have brokenness, but that brokenness is there because of me. Welcome to Confession Sunday. <laughs> Who's next? So we've been in this series that we've been calling Embracing the Breaking. And in the first message of this series, I really had no idea what, how this was going to play out for me, but the Lord just kind of led me into the home. And so the first message of this series, I preached about marriage, if you're here. Second message, we lean into the home and God's redemptive plan for the home. And so I just want to take a little bit more time in camp um, in the area of parenting. Is that okay? Yeah. We're going to talk about uh, parenting. You know, over the last um, couple weeks, I've met a new friend. Uh, his name is Brian. He goes to this church. And Brian has a, he has a beautiful baby boy. Uh, he has a very talented bride. Uh, some of you guys are getting to know her. Her name is Kim. Um, very, very talented. She actually um, does some administrative work for uh, the community and next gen here at The Rock. Amazing family. Uh, you guys will get to know them as time goes on. But uh, I was spending some time with him and we were sitting down, we were, we were eating dinner and he asked me, hey, what's your dream? Sean, what's your dream? And right away it just rose up in me. I told him, my dream is multi-generational. Okay. Hey, baby. Say, so my dream is multi-generational. I told him that, you know, I want to see my kids become champions, that I want to shoot them like straight, fiery arrows out of my home into the heart of the kingdom of darkness. That's what I want. Right? I, I want grandchildren who boldly proclaim the name of Jesus into a world and into a future that I will never see. That's what I want, guys. That's what I'm going for. Um, I, I truly do believe this, that um, the most important gift that I offer to this world, to my country, to my city, to my community, to my church, are the four young ladies that are growing up in my house. It's the best thing I have to give. This may be a, a bridge too far, but like for me, the way I think about this, I so want to pour my life into my children to a point where when people come to them and they say, man, I want to meet your dad, I want them to be able to say, well, if you know me, you know my dad. That's what I want. That's what I'm going for. Now, I know that's high, that's lofty, it's a lot, right? But you know, Life is a slam dunk when you're living with low goals, right? <laughs> and I've told you guys this before. I don't, I have zero desire to be famous. Zero. I, like, I do not need thousands of social media followers. You know what I need? I need four. I need four. Five, if you count the blonde hair, blue eyed woman of God that lives in my house too. Okay. That's what I'm going for. And so here's what I want to do in our time that we have together. Are you guys good to ride with me for like another little while? Okay, so what I want to do is from the, the perspective of, of the parent, I want to give you a starting point and I want to give you one key. Now, I stole this, so this is not my original thought. I heard this years and years ago, but I think it applies. You know, when I was, you know, engaged to get married, I was a youth pastor I had, zero, I had zero children and I had four parenting theories. All right. You know where I'm going. Now I have four children and zero parenting theories. And so, as I thought about, you know, when I felt the Lord telling me, okay, just, let's just give some instruction in the area of parenting, I was like, okay. All right, so I just want to give you guys just one thing to think about, okay? And I want to give you one, one, one starting point and one key. And then I do also want to speak to, uh, to children in the room, 
okay? Whether young or adult children, I think I have something here for you guys as well. So hang on with it. If you're not a parent, uh, just hang on to that. I think it's going to be a blessing. And if I didn't cover the whole room, let me just tell you this as well. That there is a need for spiritual parents in this house. We desperately need spiritual moms and dads. I speak for the millennial generation. I'm like on the edge. You can barely call me a millennial, but I'll own it. All right. But we need you. I think Joanne said it perfectly when she was here, is that I think there's a kind of a desire to commission the next generation, the millennials and the, and the Gen Z. There's a desire to commission us, but we don't want commission. We want co-mission. We want you coming with us. We value family. And so we desperately need spiritual moms and dads. And we have children, spiritual children in the room that would, would gladly reach up to you. All right? So I believe there's something here for you as well. So let me get into this. So first, the starting point, uh, Paul Tripp wrote a book on parenting uh, where he says that gospel-driven, God-honoring, fruit-producing parenting doesn't just begin with theology or strategy. It begins with confession. That we need to confess. What we need to confess is that parenting is impossible. <laughs> parenting is impossible. Right? There's, there's nothing in me that's natural when it comes to parenting. I do not naturally think of the welfare of other human beings. Right? I do not naturally serve Right? I don't wake up every day thinking about how I can pour my life out to serve other human beings. Right? That's not natural for me. And so what God calls you to in parenting is utterly impossible to do in and of yourself. You and I do not have inside of us the ingredients that are necessary for God's forming to be a, God, a tool in God's hands for the forming of a human soul. And so when we think about the daily, the monthly, the yearly demand that's on us, and for some of us, this is hour by hour and minute by minute. When we think about this, we must start with confession. We have to start with confession. And if we're ever going to parent the way that God intends us to parent, we must be rescued from ourselves. Right? There aren't five steps to to being a good parent. There's no, not five steps to raising good kids, right? There's no strategy that I can give you. This isn't formulaic. Because if there was a strategy that I could give you for this, if raising good, godly kids was an issue of strategy, Jesus would have never had to come. Thank you, Tracy. I was just, I needed, I needed a little motivation. Right, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. The way your children turn out, you will have a role in that, but let me just tell you, you will not have the starring role. You don't have the starring role in that, right? And so you've probably observed this from many different circumstances, life circumstances, but I'll take it to the next level. I, I can show you from scripture, right? I can show you this. We can, go, we can name names, okay? I can show you from scripture that there are good parents who raise good children, there are bad parents who raise bad children. There are good parents who raise bad children. And there's bad parents who raise good children. It's all over, right? And so confessing what you're unable to do is essential to good parenting. So what is it? What, what do you need to confess? It's this, that you and I have no power whatsoever to produce lasting heart change in our children. That's what we have to confess. Now, this is liberating. I'm not trying to bum you out, okay? I'm taking you somewhere. All right, this is liberating because it helps us to see a very important truth about raising kids, which is we are more like our children than unlike them. We're more like them than unlike them. We too are rebellious and self-oriented. We too don't like to obey. We too push against boundaries. We too are everything our children are to our heavenly father. We're constantly doing things that we know we shouldn't do. And often as we're doing it, as we're saying it, as we're viewing it, as we're pursuing it, we know that we shouldn't be doing it and we're doing it anyway. Welcome to your children. 
And so here's what, what Paul Tripp, again, he has a book called Parenting. It's like 14 gospel principles for, I forget the rest of the tagline. But. So here's, here's what he would say. All right, he would say that if you are, if your eyes ever see and your ears ever hear the failures, the flaws, the sins of your children, it's not because they woke up one day and decided, how can I annoy my mom today? <laughs> now, some children do do that, so God bless you. <laughs> But in a general sense, that's not what they're trying to do. It is the grace of God. God is trying to show you times where you get to partner with him in that redemptive process. And so if you are shocked when you see the same behavior in your children that you exhibit yourself, the reason why you're shocked and maybe even the reason why you get upset is because you are preaching to yourself the gospel of your own arrival. And to the degree that you fail to confess your struggle is the same degree that you will be intolerant of the struggle in your children. Am I hitting anything? Oh, oh, there you are. Okay. Hello. 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 If you and I cannot humbly confess the depths of our own struggle and the daily war for our own hearts and the fact that we need forgiveness, we need to be empowered, right? We need wisdom. Right? Because we are otherwise a danger to ourselves. Okay? If we uh, forget all of that, we will not be ready to deal with the same with our children in a way that depicts grace. Right? And let me just tell you this, that nobody gives grace better than somebody who is convinced that they are in desperate need of it themselves. And there's a reason why the Bible says children do not despise the Lord's instruction. There's a reason why the Bible says, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to children, says, uh, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother's instruction when she's old. Do you know how kids can get to a point where they despise the Lord's instruction and despise their parents? I know one way. One way is when they have parents who completely ignore their own depravity and they parent as if they have already arrived. And so we, we begin with confession, right? Everything my children need, I need. Right? Everything my children need, I need. All of their struggles are my struggles. Okay, that's a, that's a starting point for us. Amen? All right, now let me give you a key. I'm running behind, so let me try to catch up. Let me give you a key. All right, so when we think about how we approach parenting, we tend to either take a traditional approach or a modern approach, right? We, we either want to control our kids or we focus on affirming our kids, all right? But when we read scripture, uh, it seems to talk a lot about discipline and instruction when giving parents directions on raising children. Let me give you a few verses of this. Do we have these guys? Uh, the Bible says, train your child in the way he should go. Famous passage, right? The Bible says, do not provoke your children to anger, Ephesians 6, 4, but bring them up in the, everyone say discipline and instruction of the Lord. Okay. Deuteronomy 6, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall, everyone say teach. Okay. So you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk uh, by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. Proverbs, Proverbs 6.20, I've already quoted this one. Right? Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. And so I believe uh, that the Bible teaches that the main goal of raising children is to make them wise. Just follow me on this. It's to make them wise. Don't just control them. Don't just affirm them. Make them wise. Now, We have to confess this, that every single one of us have jettisoned and discarded much of what our parents taught us about what was right and wrong, haven't we? Uh, And so what makes us capable of coming up with our own critical, mature understanding of right and wrong, good and bad, is not that your parents taught you exactly right, but that your parents taught you, okay? Right, and so if you have parents who have a coherent account of what is good and bad, right and wrong, wise and unwise, and if they live it consistently, 
And if they discipline you according to it, that means that there's consequences if you don't you know, do, live as they say. And if you know underneath, and this is the key, that they delight in you. Even if you grow up and you turn away and say, I have a whole different set of values that I want to live by, you've still been raised. You've still been reared. Your parents are not guilty of malpractice. Okay. But if parents live inconsistently and hypocritically, right? When I say hypocritically, I think of the old adage, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But, but the truth to that is that your kids are going to do what you do no matter what you say. And so if parents live inconsistently and hypocritically, and if uh, parents don't delight and they don't train and they don't discipline, they don't teach, and we just let our kids loose to be their own free autonomous selves to just figure out what's right and wrong, then that's malpractice according to scripture. Amen? And so your child needs to know that you delight in them no matter what. They need to know that you have a coherent understanding of right and wrong that you're instilling in them because it means so much. This is what they need from us. And when they grow up, they may even think you're wrong. I'm trying to take some pressure off of you, okay? They may even think you're wrong, but they will still know that you prepared them for their lives. Okay, take some pressure off yourself. You're not God. You can release your children to God. You are free right now in the name of Jesus to be human. And what your children need from you is a, a parent that will sit down with them right next to them and say, hey, I know how this feels. I've been here. I had to do this with my daughter. I had to come to her and I had to say, I am so sorry that I made fun of you. Because when you fail, it's not funny to me. It's not. Our kids need parents who can say that. Now quickly, I just want to speak to young, young and adult children real quick. Let me see if I can belt this out. So in the Bible, when it comes to a child's relationship with parents, there's one word that comes up over and over again. You hear this word over and over again. That word is honor. Okay, Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. Or in a negative sense, you see, do not despise your father and mother. And the opposite of despise is honor. Right? And so honor is what you hear over and over again. Now, what's interesting about this, you, you see this in the Ten Commandments, right? Honor your, your father and mother so it will go well with you. It's really interesting to me um, that what's in that passage is very specific. So what's in there is interesting, but what's not is just as interesting. Like, why doesn't it say children love your parents? Children trust your parents. Why, why does it say uh, to, to honor your parents? You know, I heard... Uh, Tim Keller, he preached a sermon on this back in like 2005. I didn't even have kids, and now I'm finally getting it. Um, but this is, this is what he taught me there. He said, there's an enormous range through which you relate to your parents. Okay, There's a relationship with your parents when you are a child. And in that relationship, right, to not uh, listen to what they say, to not obey them, is that could actually be catastrophic. It can be very, very, it can be a disaster. Right? But at the other end of the range, when you're an adult, right, to obey your parents actually may be just as much of a disaster. Okay? And so there's this enormous range of relationship that you have with your parents. Right? But not only is there an enormous range of relationship you can have with your parents as you move along in this life, there is an enormous range in the quality of parents. Um, I think I can say this without fear of contradiction, all right? But one half of all parents are below average. Any arguments? Okay, can I I'm gonna take another step then? If one half of all parents are below average then I think we can also say that there are some parents who are poor parents. 
Are you still with me? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to take one more step then. <laughs> one half below average. Some are poor. There are some parents that you could call evil. Right? There are some parents you can call evil. And this is why the Bible is so smart. It's, it's consummate wisdom. It's the consummate wisdom to say that there's only one thing, no matter what is going on, no matter what condition you're in, no matter what condition your parents are in, but you you must fulfill it no matter who they are, what they've done, what they haven't done, you must honor them, the Bible says. Now, honor is a very unsentimental word, okay? It's a very unsentimental word. That the word honor in Hebrew means kabod, which is where we get our word glory, all right? It means to treat them like they matter, like they have worth. All right, that's what it looks like to honor them, okay? So four quick ways to, to honor your parents and I'll get out of your way, all right? Because I want to give you something practical, all right? What does it look like to honor your parents? There's four different things. Number one, in your culture, find the appropriate symbols by which you show them respect, okay? Now, these aren't mine, okay? I was given these, but these are fire, all right? In your culture, find the appropriate symbols by which you show them respect, what does that look like in your culture? In my house, can I just tell you guys, to honor me looks like the biggest piece of chicken. <laughs> if I sit down at the table and it's time to eat and I got a little wing on my plate or a drumstick and I look over and my daughter has a thigh, that is disrespect. <laughs> okay, that's what it looks like. What does it look like? In your, in, in your context, okay? Is it the biz- biggest piece of chicken? Is it the place at the table? Maybe there's a specific spot that you sit when you eat dinner. Maybe you get the recliner chair. Maybe you get the remote. It's the remote. Do not touch my remote, okay? You know, maybe it's remembering special days, letting them speak first in certain situations, right? These are all cultural symbols. So figure out what those are, right? And show your parents honor that way. Number two, don't underestimate your parents' need to see themselves reproduced in you. Don't underestimate that. And what I mean when I say that is any place you can say, I got that from you and it's good. I learned that from you and it's good. I got this trait from you and it's good. Say it. It honors them. Okay. Number three, don't stereotype them. Let them change. Okay. People can change. People can change. Even though they were the same way your whole life, all the way up into your 20s, all right, your parents can change. Proverbs 20, 20, listen to this verse. It says, if a man curses his father and mother, his lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. Okay, that means that one of the ways you honor your parents is by forgiving them. And if you cannot forgive your parents, your life will be distorted. It will be distorted. You know, um, I didn't hear from my biological father until I was in my 30s. I met him one time when I was, I think, eight years old or so, just real quick, and it didn't go well. And so I didn't even hear from him until I was in my 30s. And we connected on Facebook. We began to have a short conversation, and then he sent me the most sincere, heartfelt apology asking for forgiveness. And I can just, I'm happy to tell you guys that when he sent that to me, It meant everything to respond back to him that I had forgiven him long before he sent the apology. And you know why I had to do that? It's because I was a dad. And I knew there was no way I was going to be able to father well if I was holding on to resentment for my dad. And so here's what I'm trying to say to you right here is that if you are still mad at your parents, you're still a child. If you're still mad at them, they haven't grown you up. They haven't raised you. Okay. Lastly, be liberated from them. See, at some point, uh, you'll need to be able to say to your parents, I do not need your approval anymore. Right? And so if you had really good parents, then you can easily spend the rest of your life trying to please them and never living up. And if you had bad parents, you can spend the rest of your life being upset because they didn't love you. All right? And so either way, you haven't left them. They haven't grown you up. That's what that looks like. Amen.
Let's stand together. Um, embracing brokenness in the area of parenting, it, it looks like confession. Okay, it looks like confessing your inability to produce lasting heart change in your children. Okay, um, it, it looks like extending grace to your children and teaching them how to be wise. And embracing brokenness as a child, whether young or adult, embracing it means to honor your parents. It means to, to honor them even knowing that they are not finished products, right? Treating them like they matter, like they have weight, right? That's what it means. And so this is hard, isn't it? This, this, is, this is tough, this is hard. So how do we do this? How, how, do, how, do, we, how do we actually do this, one word? I'm trying to land a plane. One word, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus gives you the power to be able to do this. All right. Because here's the, the reality. God has a dream for you that is multi-generational. All right. All right. God desires to make you a champion on this earth. Right. God wants to shoot you like a straight, fiery arrow into the heart of the kingdom of darkness. And one of the ways that he wants to do that is by helping you raise children who boldly proclaim the name of Jesus on this earth into the future and into a world you'll never see. This is how he wants to do it. This is how he wants to do it. So this is, this is what this is about, guys. That the, the consummate you know, the, the way to, to be able to uh, help our children is to extend grace and to admit that we're human. But for Jesus, the way to redeem the world was to become human, All right? Bible says that we need to teach our children wisdom. The Bible says that, God, that Jesus is the wisdom of God, okay? We can go on and on and on. Jesus walked on this earth and he honored his father better than anyone. The best contribution God ever gave to this world was Jesus. And as he walked along this earth, people began to talk to him about his father. You know what he said? He said, me and my father are one. If you know me, you know my dad. Jesus honored his father all the way to the cross. And as he sat there on the cross, dying for me and you, he asked his father one question. And that question was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the one time Jesus addressed his father, talked to his father, and didn't call him father. And the reason why is because he wasn't being treated as a son so that you and I could be. This is what it looks like, church. Amen. You've been really, really patient. It's a long sermon. So with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, is there anyone here who would say, Sean, I need this Jesus in my life? If in fact, being able to thrive in the area of parenting means that I have no ability to actually produce the outcomes that I'm looking for, and I, I need Jesus. If you just slip your hand up, I wanna pray for you because there is empowerment here for you, that Jesus is here. He wants to help you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Anyone else? I know we're late, but we'll take a moment. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe you're here and you are a child, you're an adult kid, right? And you have struggled with this relationship with your parents, but you understand now the importance of honor and what it looks like and the way that it can be transformational. And you're here, you say, Sean, I need Jesus to help me with that. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you as well. I see you. I see you all across the room. I see you guys. So Father in heaven, I just present to you, your people, I thank you. Lord, we desire to honor you with our lives. 
Lord, we desire to bring our whole selves to you, God. That if you are helping us to walk in truth and transparency and vulnerability and repentance, Lord, may it start in our hearts right now. And so with all the the hands that were raised across the room, Lord, I pray that you would see them. You know who they are. I pray that you would come into their lives, into their hearts right now. Lord, would you empower them to embrace their brokenness, Lord God, so they can be representatives on this earth, children of God on this earth. We just thank you in Jesus' name.